Hi, I'm Sean, this is Chang, and welcome to Software for Science. Sean is moving today, so there, there are tons of boxes in his house, so we're going to try and record outside. Also, it'd be a really close-up video. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, la in our last video, we got about a 50-fold speed up. How much more can we squeeze out from our computer? Sean, what's your thought? And what what else can we do? This is fairly close to what I expected, but the first thing that we can try next is to coalesce all of those vectors into a matrix. So this will be our level three, I guess. Let's do it. What do you have in mind? Our next option is to try to perform all of those subtractions at the same time using just one operation. So now there would be no loops in your Python code. So Sean, um, we got from four seconds to two seconds. That's pretty good. But my question is, why do we get, how, how, how can when we switch from a list of arrays to a NumPy matrix, we've got two, like, even better. Like, wh where does that two second come from? Yeah, getting from six minutes to four seconds wasn't enough. You wanted to get further. No, not <laughs> enough. You got to tell me why. Okay. So uh, the majority of the time we were spending um, in computation at that point was actually shuffling around these very small arrays. Um, so this means that we were doing little computations for very small amounts of space, and then we spent a lot of time checking to see if it's still live. And that's actually not really necessary. We don't need to performance test the garbage collector. Instead, we can just make one giant allocation with all of the data that we wanted to compute at once. And so we spend more of our time doing arithmetic and less of our time doing bookkeeping on the memory. Would you say, the, I, I'm thinking like this is like saying that I'm taking the control of instead of letting Python decide, oh, the list, I'll have a bunch of references to some objects, I'll, I'll do it myself, I'll collect them myself. So now I get the benefit. Yeah, so you're making much stronger guarantees to your, uh, I would say, compiler, but interpreter here. Um, what you're guaranteeing is that all of these things are going to be the same type and all contiguous. Okay, so there's no nulls, there's no missing data, and they're not going to be stored in different places. They're all stored in one piece. Uh, because you are willing to lose that flexibility of being able to put whatever in whatever order in that uh, list, you get the benefit of being able to do things in blocks instead mm -hmm. of doing things one at a time. Mm -hmm. And that's what you've gained. So that was the same thing you gained the first time, but now all you're doing is coalescing it into even larger blocks. Mm. So, Sean, uh, in the, our last piece of code, what are you trying to do here? Like, we already got to two seconds. You're, now you're not satisfied. You're doing something else. You're doing something I don't understand. Can you explain to our audience what we're trying to do here? So, in the last one, we tried to broadcast the array um, so that we can do all of the comparisons at the same time. And it was a little bit too ambitious, and it kind of makes sense. So, the way broadcasting works, you have to understand it on a small case before we can expand it to this one. And so normally speaking, you would take broadcasting to do something really simple like multiply a vector against a scalar, okay? So when you multiply a vector against a scalar, what you actually are thinking of is applying that scalar to each of the elements of the vector element-wise, right? But you can do this for any pair of dimensions. So you could set this up so that you actually broadcast a vector into a matrix and apply it to each of the columns or rows of that matrix. That works fine too. So that's actually almost what we're doing here. So what we wanted to do is take two matrices and compare them as if they were tensors at right angles to each other. So compare them as... Wait, what did you just say? <laughs> uh, compare them as tensors as if they're right angles to each other? Yes. So. Think of a matrix as being a 3D tensor where one of the dimensions is one. So it's only a sheet in one dimension, right? But then the next matrix is actually a sheet in the other two dimensions. So it's a three-dimensional space that we want to create out of this, but we're doing it with two two-dimensional sensors or matrices, as you'd say. Um, so the way that we did this is we sent the, uh, the dimensions to be the same as before, one, and then the same as before. And then we did one, and then the same as before, and the same as before. So it's going to be a thousand, one, one thousand, and one, one thousand, one thousand. 
okay? So because these two don't line up, they're actually going to be broadcasting along two dimensions instead. So the 1 to 1000 and the 1000 to 1 are both going to be um, broadcast at the same time. And you can imagine that this means there's a tremendous increase in the amount of data that we're actually going to compute at the end. So the result of this operation is actually a thousand by a thousand by a thousand result tensor. So that's what got us into trouble, that we actually needed to allocate eight gigabytes of space for the result, which was too much. But the idea was kind of, it was pretty in a way, that all we needed to do was take our two matrices, rotate them, and then perform the operations element-wise there. But it was, uh, it was a bit too large. So, so Sean, let me try to summarize what you just said, is that when we were broadcasting, we were trying to compute a lot of things at once. It yeah. turned out that there's too many of too many of things. When we broadcast it, you say it's 1,000 times 1,000, so it's like we're dumping 10 to the 8 or something like that, 10 to the 9. 10 to the 9. 10 yeah. to the 9 operations into our memory at once. So you said that was 8 gigs even for this small set of data. Yeah. And that was too much as in just for use, for a Mac to handle, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, it works. It's just slower. <laughs> so I guess the lesson is sometimes you got to try to find out if it works or not. Yes. In theory, it will, it will be better. And you know, on some hardware, it probably would be faster. Okay. So if I have a, maybe if, if, if I have a high performance cluster or something, that might, it might work. Or a single very powerful machine, both of those. Okay. Yeah. So next time you happen to boot up a cloud machine, go tell me. <laughs> maybe you can do it better. Actually, that would be something I'd really like to see in the comments. Maybe someone can beat me. Can you do it in less than two seconds and still do it in Python? Please let us know. I want to see it. See you next time. Yes, at Software for Science. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please press the subscribe button and we will see you next time.